generations to come. Welcome to another edition of the TDN Writers Room. My name is Bill Finley. I am a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News, and I co-host the Down the Stretch radio show on Sirius XM Radio. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone, wherever you're watching this. I'm Randy Moss with uh, NBC Sports and the Buyer Speed Figure team. I have a dog, but she's behind me on the floor right now <laughs> sleeping. I'm Zoe Cameron with First Racing and XBTV. I have my therapy dog, Doodle, here right now because I think whilst we cover the next few topics, we're definitely going to need our dog. So let's get going. Yes, a therapy dog for all of us is in order. So what we should be talking about today is a wonderful day of racing at Saratoga with Archangelo winning the Travers, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's the best three-year-old cult uh, in training. But we can't do it because once again, a big day of racing was overshadowed by tragedy and it was overshadowed by tragedy. You had two breakdowns on Travers Day, including a just awful one in the Allen Jerkins with New York Thunder. Looked almost exactly the same as what happened to Maple Leaf Mel in the test stakes. An undefeated three-year-old sprinter just a few yards from the wire in an, in on its way to victory and uh, breaks down in full view of uh, 48,000 some odd people. As I recall, when we talked about the test, I believe I said, this is terrible, but I don't know what to do about it. And if I did, I apologize because I take that back. And the subject that I want to get into today is not just the breakdowns, but why they are happening. And a big reason why is because this sport has embraced racing on dirt and dirt all the statistics show is by far the most dangerous surface among the three that we race on dirt turf and synthetic and i'll just get right to the point and we're going to talk to hall of fame trainer mark cassie about this in a little bit too there's too many nails in the coffin already we can't drive in anymore and we're getting very close to that and we tell people and we tell the animal rights community and our detractors we like to tell them we're doing everything we can to help these horses and keep these horses safe. And you know what? That's a lie because we're not, because we are, there is no movement afoot, or maybe there is in the background, but we don't see uh, out front anyone, the people that matter, the people that make these decisions, the Churchill Downs of the world, the Nairas of the world, the Breeders' Cups of the world coming forward and saying, American racing cannot continue down this path where every Saturday you turn into Fox or NBC and you're, you're afraid to watch the races because you're afraid what's going to happen and you just can't take it anymore. The answer is we have to switch to synthetic surfaces. It's the only thing that we can do to put a major dent into this problem. Sure, uh, the veterinary examinations are important and Naira's doing more of that and the various scans they do are important and everything they've done in Southern California to cut down on the number is very important. But the thing that can make the biggest difference of any, it's obvious, it's converting to synthetic surfaces. I know it's gonna be a big change. It's gonna be something that the breeders are not gonna be happy with, but what is the alternative? And I'm afraid the alternative is in 25 years, there, there's no such thing as horse racing, or maybe it exists in Kentucky and people are racing for blankets and trophies. It, it kind of like uh, they do now with steeplechase racing or something like that. And I hate to start off these podcasts with you know doom and gloom and, and things that just get us all depressed, but damn it, it's time to do something now. And the sport has to move forward. And there has to now be a very serious change in direction, synthetic surfaces. That's that's what I have to say about it, Randy. You? Yeah. I mean, how many, oh, no, not again moments are we going to have? Exactly. Thoroughbred exactly. That, that's, they're just all the time. And there's so many different avenues we could go down here. I mean, uh, I think even... Uh, Almost every breeder, I think, even though they won't necessarily say it publicly, uh, probably understands that the sport for decades and decades has been focused on more speed, more speed, more speed, and durability and soundness has almost been a secondary issue. But let's focus on the synthetic part right now. The sport has known for decades also that synthetic racing surfaces are safer, lead to fewer horse deaths, catastrophic breakdowns than dirt racetracks. Yes, dirt racetracks may have gotten safer than they were, but they're still 
uh, not even close to synthetic surfaces in terms of, of overall safety. So why hasn't the sport completely embraced synthetic racing? Obviously, they tried in California. They tried in Kentucky. Uh, those experiments uh, ended uh, for various reasons. Uh, horsemen uh, were accustomed to training for dirt. They had been raised to train on dirt. And now they were being asked to completely change their training philosophy. And a lot of them uh, didn't like that. You've got a sport that's so beholden to tradition. I mean, look at the triple crown spacing argument, that, you know, that, that they don't want to change anything. And the triple crown, for example, has traditionally been run on dirt and has traditionally been the predominant American racing surface. But you touched on the breeders. And I think that's that could be first and foremost here is that hundreds of millions of dollars and decades and decades have been spent to try to breed the perfect dirt horse, to win the Kentucky Derby, to sweep the Triple Crown, possibly. Uh, and we've seen synthetic racing. We've seen synthetic pedigrees. Synthetic racing I don't care what the proponents say. It It is a completely, in many cases, different animal than dirt racing. Less speed oriented. Uh, it, it would change the dynamic of breeding to a certain extent. So that's the question. Have we gotten to the point in thoroughbred racing where the major breeders in this country will accept a sea change in racing surfaces from dirt to synthetic. You would think after yet another catastrophic breakdown front and center at Saratoga on the heels of all the other ones that we may be at that point. I'm not convinced that we are because the sport has a, an unfortunate tradition of getting a week or two, three weeks down the road. Okay. It's died down. It's not in the newspapers anymore. It's not on TV anymore. Uh, it's bury our heads in the sand and uh, it's horse racing. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, I don't think that's the right approach, though, Zoe. I mean, we're in a hard spot right now. I mean, you're talking about the Triple Crown. We can't even agree to change the dates. Do you think there's any possibility that Churchill Downs, because it has to start from there, is going to go to synthetic? I can't see it happening. We can't agree to change the dates for the good of the sport and the health of the horses. That's just the minuscule thing that we're trying to agree on. I think it does have to start at the breeders. It has to start with perhaps the biggest stud farm there is in North America, and that is Coolmore, who stands the only two triple crown winners in justifying American Pharaoh. Does it start with them? Are they going to do something? I mean, they have huge action in Australia. And Ireland with Coolmore over there as well. So, I mean, they've got a lot of skin in the game. It does have to start with the breeders. I can't see it starting with Churchill Downs saying we're going to go to synthetic and save the sport. I mean, the protocols are definitely going to help. I'm going to read off some Santa Anita protocols. And whether you like them or not, it's very, very hard to train a horse in Southern California. Any trainer will tell you with the protocols in place, it's very, very hard. You need to have a secretary. You need to get all your ducks in a row. But you can't argue with the facts that since these have been put in place, that the deaths have gone down. Now, I've got some stats here from 2019 to 2023. So it will be year to date, 2019 compared to 2023 year to date in racing. In 2019, there were 14 deaths compared to four. That is a 69% drop, 2.81 compared to 0 0.80 in 2023 with the new protocols in place. That's a 68% drop just because of the protocols. Now, training, 13 deaths versus seven. That is a 41% drop. That alone is just from the protocols that have been put in place at Santa Anita. Now, if you Add on synthetic tracks. We're never going to get to zero. We know that, but it's certainly going to help. And when everything was going on at Santa Anita, 
the East Coast. I mean, I had some friends. Oh, my God, how can you train a horse out there? It's laughable. I'm like, be careful. It's coming your way and it's here and something needs to be done. And that is the one thing they're going to start with. Now, Naira announced that on August the 30th, they're going to put more protocols in place for workouts in the morning. Why wait? What are we waiting for? That was a week ago they announced that. Do it now. Like you can't say we're going to do this next week. It needs to be done now and show some good faith moving forward. And you're right. Horse racing has short memories. In a month from now, everything might be rosy and golden, but something has to be done. I'm really looking forward to hearing what Mark Cassie has to say a little bit later on. Zoe, to your point, I, I totally agree. I think that in Southern California, they've done a marvelous job. But my problem with that is that if that's the best we can tell the public, well, we're doing better. It's getting better. I don't think the public accepts that. And I, I want to go back to, I, I've just jotted down, um, uh, I, I have been there and seen Ruffian, Go For One, Eight Bells, Barbara, Prairie Bayou, you know, Hall of Famers, great horses, great winners. I've, I've been there to see every single one of them break down and have to be euthanized. But even uh, Barbara, which was 17 years ago, 2006, I don't recall anyone standing up and saying, we've got to shut this sport down. You know, it was it was something that was bad news for one day in the papers. And then we all kind of moved on. And it was a terrible thing to say. But back then, everybody used to say, oh, it's just part of the game. But since Barbro in 2006, the way the American public looks at how people treat animals and what is OK and what isn't OK has changed dramatically. And you know what? I'm glad that it has, because I don't think people are wrong about this, that, you know, it's not right for animals to go out and die for our pleasure, which is essentially um, what, what is happening right now. So and here's another thing. To, we haven't, you know, let, I'll do a Randy Moss deep dive in, into some of the statistics here, courtesy of Lucas Marquardt, who wrote uh, in the TDN about the need for going to synthetics. He says from 2009 to 2022, there has been 6,036 fatalities on dirt surfaces. And that's only in racing. It doesn't include training. Um, uh, and that's a 1.86 per 1,000 starters. On synthetic, there have been 534 fatalities. Wish, wish it was zero, but it's not. But 534 equals 1.11 fatality per 1,000 starters. That's a 68% difference. He said, had the numbers on dirt matched the numbers, the percentages that we get on synthetics would have saved the lives of two. This is a staggering number, 2,437 fewer fatalities. And, you know, I'm, I'm saying the same thing, largely what I, I said before, but 2,437 fatalities and we won't. And we may not do well. I, I, we will. We won't. I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen either. But who can look at ourselves in the mirror as an industry and say we could have saved the lives of twenty four hundred horses, maybe twenty four hundred horses in the future? And you know what? We're not going to do it. Oh man, um, you know. And and Mark Cassie's going to get emotional about this. I'm going to get emotional too. Um, I'm getting up in years. I would hate to be a twenty five year old getting started in this industry right now and wanting to make my entire career out of it, I meaning you got to last for another 45 years or something. Boy, that's going to be tough. Yeah. Uh, even before this past Saturday at Saratoga, for example, PETA was calling for the racing season at Saratoga to be suspended, just as it was at Churchill Downs, before New York Thunder. And when we and when we talk about the the public perception of things like that, I mean the New York Thunder thing was as bad as it gets, right? But it was on a Saturday in August at Saratoga. It was on Fox. You know, people were thinking about football now. But imagine, just imagine, the first Saturday in May, an undefeated horse, right, uh, getting all the attention that an undefeated horse would get in the Kentucky Derby. Uh, kicking clear from his competition in mid-stretch, drawing off to a five or six length lead, and then snapping his leg at the 16th pole. 
in front of tens of millions of viewers on NBC at the Kentucky Derby. Just think of the outcry. And, oh, by the way, if it was in the Preakness, if the horse was forced to run back in two weeks, imagine then what we would be looking at. Uh, it, it, we mentioned breeders. Uh, and I, again, as we said, I agree. I'm skeptical that anything is going to happen. But there are some breeders, uh, Bill Kasner, right, who wrote an op-ed for TDN in June. He's been a longtime proponent of this. When Maidan pulled out its Tapita racing surface in 2014, nine years ago, here's what Kasner was quoted as saying, and boy, does it ring true right now. He said, when a horse breaks down anytime, it's a terrible thing. But when a horse breaks down in front of the grandstand in the afternoon, two things happen. People will turn around and leave the track in droves, never to return. And a jockey will go, will go down and be injured to some degree, whether it's a bruise or whether it's paralysis. When there are agendas placed above the safety of horses and riders, to me, it is unconscionable. So Bill is no longer involved directly with, with Windstar Farm, but there are I think there are breeders and former breeders out here, whether there are enough of them uh, to sound those alarms. And trainers like Mark Cassie, I guess we'll see. Yeah, there, there's no easy way to word it. And a New York Thunder wasn't the only one on Saturday. No bell on the turf after the race. A lot of people never even knew that happened. I was there, and it was a h horrific. Um, both horses, people did get up, and people left and said, we're never coming back. I saw families leave with their kids bawling. It was about one of the worst things that you could possibly see. And I've seen a lot. I have seen too much and it was horrible, really. So I don't know what the answer is. I, I will say one thing uh, for synthetic tracks is it's very kind on the horses. For the people, not quite so much. And I've spoken to a lot of jockeys over the years and Renee Douglas was one of the first to go down on the synthetic at um, at Arlington Park, it, it's not good to fall on. It's it's not jockey friendly. I will say that much. I've fallen on it and you stick. Tyler Gaffleone was incredibly lucky. He went down on both horses on Saturday. And I mean, kudos to him to even want to stick a leg over the back of the horse. He was off on Sunday because he was sore. He went down on the turf on Noble and then New York Thunder, but he slid. And one of the things about the synthetic track, if you're a jockey and I'm a former jockey, you fall off and you hit and it hurts and there is no slide and no give. Now, it's better for the horses, but jockeys do get hurt on it. And I'll just leave that at that. And I'm a proponent for synthetic tracks, but that is one factor that I'm not sure anyone's looking into. I do want to remind you that the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. The catalog for the Keeneland September sale is out and it's online. There are 4,194 horses entered for the sale. And for the third straight year, the sale kicks off with a two-day book one, followed by a two-day book two. The latest Keeneland September successes include Archangelo. How good was he on Saturday? He followed his Belmont Stakes triumph for the decisive Travers win. Archangelo is a mere $35,000 September yearling. And that's not all. Echo Zulu. Winner of the Grade 1 Ballerina was also a Keeneland September grad, sell, selling for $300,000 to l and Racing and Winchell Thoroughbreds. That looks like a steal as well. Learn more about the Keeneland September sale, which runs September the 11th through the 23rd at the theworldsyearlingsale.com. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. If this place could talk. It would roar. It would say, this is racing. This beating heart in the heart of horse country. Steady and strong beneath the roar. Reminding us why. For the love of the horse. For generations to come.
The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Stone Street. Watch out for the 59 Stone Street bread to the upcoming Keelan September sale. The sale will take place from September the 11th through the 23rd. Stone Street Breads won two races this past Saturday. First was Alexa Liu, who won a 2023 debut at Alice Park for owners Rock Ridge Racing. The three-year-old daughter of Spitestown now has two wins from three lifetime starts. And then there was Pride of the Nile, who was second in the Grade 1 Starlet at two. She won a Del Mar allowance for her owners, West Coast Stables. The filly was a $140,000 Keelan September yearling. Stone Street, born to run, raised to win. The TD and Riders Room is brought to you by the Fast Sires at Windstar Farm, the sponsor every week of the fastest horse of the week. This week, we're focusing on the stallion, Improbable, a grade one winner as a two-year-old, Eclipse champion, older male, with three consecutive grade one wins. The awesome again, the Whitney, the Hollywood Gold Cup, and of course, he was then second in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Improbable's first yearlings are on the market now, have sold for up to $425,000 with eight sold so far. He is sporting an impressive average sale price of $217,500. You can look for those improbable yearlings at the Keeneland September sale. Fastest horse of the week. You saw her Saturday, ballerina handicap, Echo Zulu. Okay, Chad Brown trained Goodnight Olive impeccably for the ballerina handicap. To, ha to have a career best performance. She ran a 108 buyer speed figure and Echo Zulu just kicked away from her through the lane like it was nothing for a back-to-back -back 112 buyer speed figure. Now, how impressive are back-to-back -back 112 buyer speed figures? If you look at the history of buyer speed figures, okay, published in the Daily Racing Forum. Here I go, Zoe, I'm going down a rabbit hole. Female sprinters, there have only been two of them that had back-to-back -back speed figures as high as Echo Zulu. Educated Risk was one of them, trained by Suge McGahee. The other one, I know you probably know who it is, Extra Heat, did it five times in one year in 2001. Extra Heat ran 113, 113, 117, 118, 120. That's the kind of rarefied air that Echo Zulu reached on Saturday with her back-to-back -back 112 buyer speed figures this time in the Ballerina Handicap. Echo Zulu, this week's fastest horse of the week. Next up, the TD and Riders Room brought to you by The Green Group, a tax accounting and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry and designed to save you taxes. And we welcome in now the Green Group guest of the week. He's a Hall of Famer both the United States and Canada, Mark Cassie. And uh, Mark put in a very good Q&A this week in the Thoroughbred Daily News about all the controversies going on now in racing and about synthetic surfaces. Nobody has a better feel for this perhaps than Mark Cassie because he races at Woodbine on the synthetic and races throughout the US on dirt and turf. Uh, Mark, we just had a spirited discussion among the three of us about the future of racing, the future of synthetic tracks. We'll cut right to the chase. Is it time now, considering all the awfulness that racing's been going through uh, over the last uh, several years, for this sport to bite the bullet and say it's time to convert to synthetic tracks? I think it is. I, I, I mean, we've got years and years of data that says it's far safer. And and look, the, the path we're going down right now is is, is ugly. And we have to do something and we have to do it quickly. And it's, it's going to take a drastic measure. So, as you know, as we all know, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested by breeders in dirt stallions, dirt pedigrees, uh, trying to get dirt horses for the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness and the Belmont. What do you think is going to have to happen in order to convince these breeders to up in that and to switch to synthetic? Well, I'm, honestly, Randy, I think it's probably, I think it, it would be, a, it's not as big a worry as they make it to be. I think the majority of horses, 
I would I would say this. It's my experience. Maybe one out of 10 horses don't like synthetic. I would say that three out of 10 may not like turf. And one out of 10 don't like, or nine out of 10 don't like the dirt. I, I, I think we can get these horses, you, you know, we don't know. You're sitting there and saying, well, we've got the dirt breeding. Most of that, a good horse will run on anything pretty well. Um, and I can tell you, they'll run a lot longer and last a lot longer. Would this be the case, Mark, of say you have 10 horses by Justify all running on the synthetic racetrack? It's just going to be the fastest horse at the end of the day. Is that what's going to try and save our sport is bringing synthetic back in? And what do we have to do differently? Because you are the expert. You've been doing this for 40 years. You've probably seen more synthetic tracks than the rest of us all together. What do we need to do better with the synthetic tracks that we didn't do at Keeneland in California or the other places that they were put in and then ripped out? Well, I don't I, I don't think you can put Keeneland in that category. Keeneland's, in my opinion, um, changed not because of because the success of their synthetic because it was pretty good. Now, yeah. in the beginning, look. Tapita's come or synthetic has come a long way. I think anybody that will sit there and tell you that that California did a good job when they put theirs in in the beginning would be lying. We we know that they had lots of issues. I think they did a poor job of putting it in. I ran at Del Mar the last meet we had in, on synthetic, and um, I told all those guys. They're like, oh, we're so happy to be going back to dirt. And I said, be, be careful what you wish for. And I, I saw some statistics today when they went back to Santa Anita on dirt. The the fatality rate was crazy high. So, um, yeah, we're, we've got a better, we have a better uh, synthetic surface now than, than we had then. Just look. The statistics don't lie. I just, I look today. It's amazing. I think uh, Woodbine started mid-April. Uh, they've had something like 4,500 starts over Tapita and have had two fatalities. They've only had one on the turf, and that horse got kicked. And I, I, I also read where they had 14,000 wor recorded workouts. And two, I mean, we had more than that in one week in, in Saratoga and Kentucky. So, I mean, it's amazing. Look at, look at what Gulfstream, Gulfstream put in a synthetic track. And I think they've had one, one breakdown, one fatality since it was put in. And, and Gulfstream's not even benefiting from the full effect of synthetic. You only can run a, a synthetic at Gulfstream. You get to train, you can breeze over it, but you don't get to train every day over it. I believe that these injuries that we're seeing on the turf are, are coming from turf horses that are training over a dirt track that they don't care for. And it goes for a while and every day it wears and wears and wears on them. And then the next thing you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back. You know, I, I said in my uh, in my uh, my the TDN the other day, it's like you have a car and 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 the balance the wheels aren't balanced. You go down the road and it's blah 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 blah, and the hubcap flies off. It wasn't the hubcap's fault. So uh, I, I believe that, and I think the statistics show it that not only is it safer to run on, it's safer to train on. And without a doubt, not even close, even if you have a great dirt track, they, they may be equal on a good day, but they're so, far superior on a bad day. I also believe, and, and some people aren't going to like this, but I think that, especially on dirt in dirt racing, it's mostly speed, speed, speed. And I think that that's dangerous. I, 
look at it. If, if you go the first quarter in 21 flat, um, I don't know the miles per hour, but it, it's a lot faster than if you go in 22 flat. When you run on synthetic, it's the, the fractions are more equal over a period of time. You don't have, have the, uh, the craziness. And, and, you know, we just lost two grade one, really good grade one horses. And what did they do? They were fast, fast. They ran as fast as they could. And, and that was that ended up being their demise. And so I, I believe there's a lot of trainers out there that like fast horses and want to go as fast as they can. And you run everybody off their feet. But I, I think in the end, that's that's not that's dangerous. Mark, of late, it seems like the sport just goes from one tragedy to the next. And, you know, every time something happens, we all just throw our hands up in the air and say, boy, what are we going to do? Isn't this a shame? And I commend you for for being somebody who's been outspoken, not only about this, but but a lot of subjects uh, that uh, you're not happy with, with horse racing. And I think that the reason would is that you seem to be genuinely concerned, as I think you should be, about the future of this sport. Now, you've had a great career. You're in two Hall of Fames, but you have a son who trains. You said you have another son who, who uh, may get into training. How concerned should we be about the future of the sport unless we do do something dramatic, perhaps go to synthetic, perhaps something else? But if we just com- continue with the status quo, where is this all headed? We can't. We have to be better. Um, as I said the other day, we're still using, we're still using the same type of track that we used a hundred years ago or 125 years ago. You know, we, we have the technology, we have this, the statistics, we have to do something about it. And as you said, Bill, you know, this is not about me. Uh, my career's, my career's coming to an end and, but it's about, two sons that I have that are are behind me. And, 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 you know, this game has given so much to me. I just, for the first time, and this is sad to say, I'm not as proud to be a horse trainer as I used to be. And that's, that's sad. I mean, here, here, you know, I've been very fortunate two Hall of Fames, and I'm not proud of our sport. That's that's sad, and in my opinion, it's dangerous. And I'm going to do whatever I can do to help it. And frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn who I piss off or upset. Yeah, in the aftermath of the New York Thunder breakdown, Jorge Delgado uh, had some quotes that were similarly uh, kind of emotional about his view of being a horse trainer and the challenges right now of being a horse trainer. So, in order to in order to change this, you mentioned Keeneland and and Keeneland surface met with rave reviews when it was Polytrack, but in the end, they chose to change it. Uh, in part, according to Bill Thomason at the time, because it didn't have the acceptance of horsemen and fans. Part of it was because I think the bluegrass stakes had become almost irrelevant as far as a prep to the Kentucky Derby. Do you think that in order to start this change to synthetic racing surfaces, that it has to start with Churchill Downs in the Kentucky Derby and then the Preakness and then the Belmont? Again, I'm not going to make people happy, but yes, yes, I think, I think it's interesting. I think it was about 15 years ago. I sat on a committee uh, in um, New York and uh, Todd was there. uh, Dale Romans were there. Nick Zito was there. And we talked about it. And at that time I said, you know, we have a crisis because we were, this is not our first crisis. We've been through a few of them. And and I think at the time, I don't think New York had the money to do it, to go synthetic. If they had, they would have already paid for it because these three and four horse fields, when we come off the turf, they don't, they, those won't exist because a lot of those horses will run on the synthetic. 
But um, I think New York has to go. If New York goes synthetic, if somehow you get Churchill Downs to go synthetic, um, that, that's what's going to have to happen. And we have to do something. Um, you mentioned Keeneland. I, I don't know if you remember any, but I think it, it was like 30 days prior to them call, saying they were going to go back to dirt. The Jockey Club came out with statistics at that point in time. And I was furious when Keeneland and I let everybody know I was furious about it. I didn't hold it back then. And um, you're you're 100 percent right. They they thought that the Ashland and the bluegrass had lost its prestige to get them to the Derby. Interesting enough, um, I happened to listen, hear a trainer who is a very good trainer. He's now retired. Tell somebody, I like synthetic, but if we run on it at Keeneland, this this person trained in New York, if he runs on it and they run well, we they won't let us take the horse to New York because they'll they'll seek out synthetic instead. So there were guys not running their horses simply because they didn't want to expose their hand. Right now, is it going to change some things? Yeah. Are some of the turf sires probably going to raise up a little bit? Yes, they are. But we can adapt. I mean, look at Pioneer of the Isle. He was a great synthetic horse, and he's turned out to be a very good sire. It's not, it's, I think we're worrying about something. It'll all work out. I can tell you this, and, and I, I think I've earned my stripes in this part of it. Um, you'll get a lot more starts out of horses. It, it's just not, it's, it just, it's not as fatiguing. It's not as hard on them. These horses will get more starts. And if they get more starts, that's better for owners. That's better for breeders. They're just worried and, and they're worried. And I understand, but they're not. It, we have to fix something. We cannot continue to go down the road. We are. And look, this is not for me because I don't know. Maybe 10 more years for me. Right. I'm fine. I can, I can, we can stop tomorrow and I'll go play golf and I'll be just fine. Mark, in your, in your opinion, what is the best synthetic surface that you've seen and what else does it bring to the table? I know that you mentioned that, you know, we've, we've had the, we're getting rid of Lasix, right? It's pretty much going to be gone. No, I, I disagree. I disagree. I do not think we're going to get rid of Lasix. Okay. I, but I, I think you mentioned that it's a little better for bleeders. You've had yeah. with, with not even close, not right. even close. So uh, I tell everybody, you know what? I do my own studies. We, I have, uh, I would say on an average week, we would breeze and run probably about 40 to 50 horses on dirt. Well, yeah, 40 or 50, we breeze or on dirt and the same on, on synthetic. When I get my reports at the end of the day from the veterinarians, you would be shocked where I, it, it's not uncommon for me to breeze 20 horses on a Saturday or Sunday at Woodbine and then run another 10. And this is how many would bleed. Zero. You work, you work 10 horses at Churchill Downs. On Lasix, half of them will come back and bleed. Just less stress. It's less stress. It's also it's not it's it's environment as well. You know the cooler weather helps definitely, but there's no question it it it, it takes the biggest problem with synthetic is it's so kind on them that you cannot get them ready to run on dirt. They because they bounce over it. Um, I, I I said something in my article about Patrick Husbands. You know, saying he he told me, and he's been riding synthetic now for twenty some years, and I'm going to knock on wood when I say this, but he said he's never had a horse fall with him on the synthetic, and he said it's because when a horse gets hurt, it actually gives back and it catches them a little bit. Now, it's I'm not saying 
that a horse, I don't want anybody to go, oh, well, um, show me this one fell, this one. I'm not saying that horses don't fall, but you just don't see the same horrendous injuries. You got to think about, and so you know as well as I do, sometimes it's one step they hurt themselves when they ca- try to catch themselves, then it's ugly. Well, on dirt, it's a thud. They just hit. There is no give. Synthetic gives a little bit back. It bounces back and it catches them a little bit. And so I, I believe that that is probably why we don't you know, see the same amount of fatalities. Mark, I am in agreement with you. I too believe we should convert to synthetic surface racing. But um, I think at the same time, I'm being a little naive to think that it will happen. I just don't see it happening. I hope I'm wrong. But, you know, how do you feel about that? And are the Mark Cassies of the world and the Bill Finleys of the world who want to see this change, are we being naive to think that it might happen? Maybe. All I can do, Bill, I'm going to give you everything I have. Um, I believe in it. I'll go down fighting. If it is, you know, I can only... You can only do, you can only do so much, right? I'll do my best. I'm doing my best. Um, I'm not a good loser. In the uh, in the midst of the decision in Southern California to pull up the synthetic racing surfaces, you heard some trainers complain that yes, you had fewer catastrophic breakdowns on synthetic, but you had more other types of injuries on synthetic. It was a common refrain from trainers, hind in injuries, things like that. What's your opinion on that as someone who has trained more horses on synthetic than almost anyone else in America? Can I say a bad word? Sure. Bullshit. <laughs> it's absolute bullshit. And I have the I have the statistics and the records to show it. That is the biggest crock of bullshit that you can come with and you only need to if you if you read uh uh, bill castner's his article today with the breakdown of how things happen it's crazy i get horses from people i train for different owners and some of them have different trainers anytime a horse gets a tendon or a suspension or hurt guess who they send them to me and you know why Because they know that I have the best record of getting those horses back to the races. And you know why? Because I take them to Woodbine on synthetic. So that's a big, I I mean, Randy, maybe in the beginning that was the case. That when those tracks were maybe not as good, maybe they had some. But, But nobody, one, for the most part, most trainers have short memories. Short memories. I mentioned that to my colleagues when they wanted dirt in California. I said, you have short memories, short, short memories. And look, all horses, we have issues. <laughs> the crazy thing, I had 30 horses here at Saratoga. I've had one horse get hurt at the meet. Guess how it got hurt? In the stall. So they're going to hurt themselves. They're going to do things. But it is to sit there and to say there's not even close. For instance, of those, of those, I don't know, what did I say? I have 5,000 starts on dirt and 5,000 on synthetic, something like that. I would tell you the, the, the rate of uh, soft tissue injuries is four or five times greater on dirt than it is on synthetic. Yeah. You Just, mentioned Kasner. Kasner mentioned in that op-ed article that he thought – some of the hind end injuries on synthetic were initially caused by trainers using toe grabs on horses in the rear, which he said has turned out to be a complete no-no on synthetic. You you agree? Yeah, we we need a little slide, and and we do do that, and and I just I'm just telling you that well we don't use toe grabs on them behind, so we don't in Canada. We have a uh, queen's plate, so. Uh, it's interesting because we've went on so many different paths. You know, uh, I, I find it amazing. We've gotten stricter, stricter on uh, shockwave treatment. We've got stricter on injecting joints and everything. 
Woodbine has the most lenient rules in North America and the least amount of breakdowns. So I think a lot of times we're climbing, we're barking up the wrong tree. There's only one tree to bark on and it's on the track. Well, some very powerful stuff from Mark Cassie. We really appreciate his candor. Marks, thanks so much for being the Green Group Guest of the Week on the Thoroughbred Daily News Podcast. And keep speaking out. Racing needs more voices like your own. And thank you. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Mark Cassie will receive a free one-hour tax consultation with the Green Group. For more information on how the Green Group and Lynn Green can help save you money on your taxes, you can log on to www.greenco.com and find out for yourself. Are you paying too much in taxes? The Green Group can help. There's a reason the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisors. They save you money and share successful strategies. Over the past 40 years, the Green Group founder, Len Green, has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport, like Eclipse award-winning champions, Jaywalk and Wonder Wheel. His DJ stable competes at the highest level and has received the game's most prestigious honors. Len Green's in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the thoroughbred business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The PA Horse Breeders Association presents the Pennsylvania Stallion Series. Six races for PA sire, PA bred two-year-olds at parks. Two $100,000 contests at five and a half furlongs. On August 21st, PA Day at the Races. September 23rd, PA Derby Day has two races at six and a half furlongs, both with a $150,000 purse. And in December, two races going long, each worth $200,000. For more, go to pabred.com. The TD and Riders Room is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. Another big week for Pennsylvania bread. You might have watched at Saratoga on Friday, the smart and fancy stakes for female sprinters on the turf. Roses for Deborah, trained by Christophe Clement, winning again. She is now undefeated on turf or synthetic, and she is a Pennsylvania bred, bred by Blackstone Farm. Speaking of synthetic, and we've talked a lot about synthetic on this program already, Roses for Deborah will head next to the Master Stakes, Grade 2 at Presque Isle Downs on that Trex Tapita, scheduled for September the 18th. Also, a reminder, September 23rd is the date for the next two races in the Pennsylvania Sired Pennsylvania Bread Stallion Series, featuring two $150,000 races, both at six and a half furlongs, one for two-year-old Colts, the other for two-year-old Phillies. Well, can we finally talk about something that's a little bit more uplifting here on the TDN Writers Room podcast? And that was the Traverse Stakes. And it really lived up to the billing, Uh, brings back the two-year-old champion Forte and the three winners of the individual Triple Crown races. Going in, it really looked like it was going to be the race that would define the division and we'd find out who the best horse among this group is. Found out definitively, Archangelo, Jenna Antonucci, Javier Castellano, decisive win, beat the best of the best. And we have now a horse that has taken over control of this division. Uh, I think unless something big happens in the Breeders' Cup Classic and the race is won by another three-year-old, might even have cemented a three-year-old a champion uh, with that. A um, couple other thoughts. It was a weirdly won race. Why was it National Treasure on the lead early? That was very strange. What was Tappa Trice doing so close? Also, um, you know, the story of who ran well uh, is, of course, um, Disarm, who was second, and Archangelo, but not a good effort for Forte, he was fourth, National Treasure fifth, and Mage, Kentucky Derby winner, was seventh and last. So we saw some pretty disappointing performances, but taking nothing away from Archangelo, he, Randy, is the real deal. Yeah, I couldn't have been more wrong in my at pre-race analysis of the Traverse Stakes. Oh, you were there. I know you were super impressed with Archangelo, right? Oh, yeah. He was you know, I think I said it last week. He was of all the horses that trained up to the Travers. He was the one that sluiced through the racetrack like it was butter. He has looked picture perfect each and every day, coming off an 11-week net layoff, 
without, you know, your six, seven day works every 10 days, every 12 days. He flew around the racetrack every morning, never missed a note, looked healthy and happily and got a perfect ride from Javier Castellano, who seemingly put him in the right spot, despite, and you're going to jump into this, Arad Ortiz, perhaps on Forte, trying to knock him out the way right at the beginning. He got a great trip. This arm perhaps didn't get the best of trips. He got a teeny bit of trouble, but there is no question in my mind who the best horse was on that day. And it was Archangelo. And thank God, thank God. I mean, Jenna saved the day. If you could salvage any part of the day, that was it, that she won with that horse on that particular day. That was the only shining light. There was actually a rainbow that came up later in the day as well, which was quite quite eerie to be perfectly honest but that that was the savor of a horrible day was Arcangelo winning and he and he did it brilliantly and kudos to to Javier Castellano picking up his seventh Travers win Jenna Antonucci becoming the first woman to train a Travers winner oh second second sorry yeah, yes. second woman to train a Travers winner who was the first Mary Hirsch back in the 40s or something like that. I always get emails from, I guess it's her uh, nephew, Bill Hirsch Jr. <laughs> always reminds that. Me. Mary Hirsch, yes, won the Travis yeah. Stakes back in the 30s or 40s. Wow. So yeah. Archangelo was slicing through the surface like butter. I needed some more of that butter on my handicapping toast before the <laughs> uh, before the Travis Stakes. My, my rationale was that in the Belmont, Archangelo got a perfect rail trip, got through on the inside all the way. Forte was coming into the race off, what was it, 11-week layoff, had a wide trip, still was only beaten, you know, less than two lengths. I mean, I, I thought compared to Archangelo, Forte ran a much better race in the Belmont. So I thought Archangelo was going to be over bad. Boy, was I wrong. Uh, I mean, he just rolled around those horses. I thought Forte had no excuse um, I thought he was more aggressive with blinkers in the gym dandy, but I thought he reverted in the Travers and was running in spots. Uh, he was up close early, then he dropped back to last at one point on the backstretch. When Irad got squeezed back a little bit, he was trying to push Mage out of the way going down the backside, kind of like he did in the uh, to another horse in the gym dandy. And, uh, and uh, Flavian Pratt held his ground. And, and kept Forte behind horses and kind of shuffled him back to last there. But that really wasn't an excuse because Forte rolled up at the top of the stretch. And if he had run the same way he ran in the Jim Dandy and the Belmont and all that, I think he would have been right there, but he didn't. Uh, Mage, uh, the, the footnote says that he was um, uh, shuffled back at the start a little bit. I don't agree with that. Uh, I thought he had a... Fairly good trip to the first turn, although he got a little rank at one point in between horses when Scotland crossed over on him. What I thought Scotland was going to make the lead over National Treasure. That's probably the only part of the handicapping equation in that race. I got right. Uh, but uh, Archangelo, clearly the best horse. And I agree, Bill, that he's at the top of the heap right now in the three-year-old division. And given the overall status of the Breeders' Cup Classic division, uh, I put him number two behind Wide Barrio, but I could easily see him as number one. Mary Hirsch at age 22 won the 1935 Travers. But Randy Moss, you already knew that, didn't you? <laughs> Just a rabbit hole. I didn't have the date, no. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, but congratulations to Jenna Antonucci. And uh, hey, um, you know, it was similar to Belmonte. Remember, horse broke down that day, but that was quickly forgotten. I wouldn't say quickly forgotten, but it was the the, the joy of Archangelo and Jenna Antonucci was the bigger story of the day. So uh, she has uh, maybe on two occasions now uh, helped turn a very ugly day into something less ugly. So Jenna, thank you. Oh, one more thing about Archangelo. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, unfortunately, we lost Arrogate. But for Archangelo to win and basically kind of do what Arrogate did, although no one will ever do that again. He was simply brilliant in his Travis win. But just a terrible shame that we lost him so early. He's from his second crop, just three crops of racing age for Arrogate. Yeah, and while Mike Rapoli had a brilliant two-year-old win this past weekend, I mean, disappointment with both Forte and Nest. Nest, I thought, in the personal incident on Friday was was really disappointing. I thought, you know, she sort of like Forte, kind of had dead aim at the top of the stretch, uh, but she turned out to be disappointing. 
Yeah, she, big she win, though, for Judd Mott and, uh, and yeah. Brad Cox. Yeah, Ness looked like she hated every minute of it. I would, I'm going to put a line through Nest, but then add on the Cox horse. She was good. Yeah, it, Idiomatic was, uh, was excellent, a, able to control the pace, uh, but ran a, ran a heck of a race. So, uh, yeah. In this week's Saratoga Minute, TD and producer Katie Petruniak and photographer Sarah Andrew were on site the morning after Archangelo's Travers win when Jenna Antonucci and her team launched that freshly painted Travers canoe into Saratoga's infield pond. Let's take a look. Saratoga Minute brought to you by Naira Bets. You can sign up now for Naira Bets and get a matching deposit of up to $200. It works like this. Just make a deposit within 30 days of signing up for your account. Bet twice the amount of your initial deposit and you will receive a wagering credit for the amount of that initial deposit. Again, up to $200. To sign up, use promo code SPA200 and get your deposit matched today. Quality Road. Proving Lane's Ends, tried and true stallion making tradition. A tradition that leads to success for our partners and our stallions. Quality Road has sired multiple Eclipse Award and Grade 1 winners, including champion two-year-old Colt Corniche, champion two-year-old Philly Caledonia Road, champion three-year-old Philly Abel Tasman, and multiple Grade 1 winner City of Light. He's a leader of his generation. Quality Road, a stallion that stands above the rest. The Lane's End Stallion of the Week is City of Light. City of Light is the sire of new TDN rising star Fierceness. The Mike Rapoli homebred romped home in his debut. That was impressive. Really impressive. He won by no fewer lengths than 14 lengths on Friday. It's the second TDN rising star in a month for the sire after Benedetta took a Del Mar maiden race for owner Kaleem Shah. Fierceness is full brother. Check this out, is scheduled to go under the hammer at Keeneland, September, as hip number 1390. Well, lots of other big races on the Travers card. Uh, the Forgo Ballerina Sword Dancer among four other grade one races. A um, couple quick takes. We uh, And Randy already mentioned how great Echo Zulu was in the Ballerina. She ran faster than Gunite did, the boys uh, in the Forgo. Gunite turns the tables on Elite Power. Uh, didn't see that coming. Elite Power had won eight in a row. Uh, these two horses are obviously very uh, evenly matched, and I guess it was just Gunite's turn. And one thing that I, 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 I really noticed, how about the Sword Dancer? How much better are the European turf horses oh. than our horses? Bolshoi Ballet wins the race. Okay, Aiden O'Brien, everything like that. He goes off at 5-1 to one and wins. Last time out, and granted, it's a big race, but in a Group 1 in Europe, the King George and Queen Elizabeth, he went off at 125 to one, was six beaten 21 lengths. He had lost six straight races since last running in the United States. Uh, you know, Aiden O'Brien's of the world and the Charlie Applebee's, they must think this is easy pickings. And it is for these horses when they, they come over uh, for these races. Now, maybe that'll change when uh, up to the mark gets back into the entries and, and runs against some of these guys. But uh, boy, the Europeans have our number. But uh, Randy, what stuck out to you on the undercard? Well, that was Bolshoi Ballet's first win since winning the Belmont Derby of 2021. He missed almost the entire year of 2022 with what Aiden O'Brien described as a setback. Uh, and so he finally gets into the winner's circle back in the United States. Buyer speed figure 107 for running away with the sword dancer. I want to 
I'll get Zoe's opinion on this as well, uh, about the four ago. Okay. I'm going to throw a little BS flag here on the notion that, you know, it was a brilliant move by Tyler Gaffleone to, to take Gunite off the rail turning for home and bait Irad Ortiz through on the inside with elite power. Okay. First of all, the rail was not bad. It was not a deep rail. You have elite power boxed in behind you, turning for home. You don't willingly steer into the three path and allow elite power to cut the corner and drive up inside. Okay. I, 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 no, no. Now, elite power, sure. He had won most of his races on the outside. He'd never been in that position before. They didn't know if he would run okay down on the inside or not. But to me, it didn't matter if Elite Power had come around, if Elite Power had, you know, he had a chance, plenty of room on the inside, if you watch the head-on replay, to get up on in there and and catch Gunite and outrun Gunite. He just wasn't quite the same Elite Power that we had seen earlier during that winning streak. I think that's what it all, all came down to, a fairly soft pace by Gunite, excellent performance by him. But quite frankly, and this is, uh, you know, unfortunate, unfortunately, we saw what happened on Saturday. Uh, to me, up to the 16th poll of the Allen Jerkins, I think New York Thunder had proven that he probably was going to win the Breeders' Cup sprint against either of these two horses. But unfortunately, that was not to be. But Zoe, what, what were your thoughts about what I just said about the whole baiting of Irad Ortiz to come through along the rail? Come on. I'm not buying it. That race was won in the opening quarter. 23.16. Uh, Tyler did a magnificent job of slowing down the pace in a grade one race. And that's what got the win. I don't think Elite Power could catch him after that. He had so much left in the tank. He just ran away like from Elite Power like he was tied to a tree. I think one thing that's maybe got lost in the whole shuffle of things was how good was Gunrunner on Saturday when you oh. think Gunner oh, yeah. by Gunrunner. Echo Zulu by Gunrunner. Disarm. Disarm. In the Travers by Gunrunner. How good is trainer Steve Asmussen? I pulled up um, some stats because I'm, you know, trying to be like Randy. Next week I'll <laughs> shave my head or something. But one thing that Steve is so damn good at, it looks good, Randy, is keeping hey. horses good. Like, how does he keep these horses good and consistent at the highest level for so long? And Steve prides himself in that. I mean, you'll see one-hit wonders come along all the time. The next start, you can't find them with a search warrant. But Steve consistently has these horses good. Gun it. 19 starts, 9 wins, 6 seconds, 2 thirds. Echo Zulu, 11 wins, nine, 11 starts, 9 wins, 1 third. And then you look at Gunrunner, 19 starts, 12 wins, three third place finishes. Rachel Alexandra, 19 starts, 13 wins, five second place finishes. Carlin, 16, 11, 2, 3. The guy is a genius at keeping good horses good. It's rare that you find a trainer that can keep horses good for as long as he does. And that is a huge credit to him and his team. So, I like yeah. that rabbit hole, Zoe. That's a good rabbit hole. <laughs> like that, like that. But I mean, that, that is the key with him. That's why he's trained so many good horses consistently over the years. When they get good in the Asperson barn, they stay good or they're retired. It's as simple as that. And how'd you like to be Ron Winchell right now? He brought us Tappet. Now he's brought us Gunrunner, and he's got Steve Asperson to train for him. Yeah. And then one more note on Bolshoi Ballet. I actually bet on him because I remember him coming over to Belmont. I have never seen him look so good. He trained well. I saw him on the track one day and I'm like, who is that? You know, Aiden always has the horses breeding and the name on the pad. So I've got my binoculars. I'm up on the roof and I'm like, which one of Aiden's army is this? I'm like, that's Bolshoi Ballet. Ballet? And I had to look him up because the entries went out. It seemed like a hundred years ago he just, he ran. Like, I thought he was retired already because I didn't know he was coming over. And I watched him train. I'm like, man, he looks so good. He got a stellar ride from Johnny V. Had him, like, up there in the hunt. That horse has never been in the hunt like that before. That was the difference maker. And plus the fact I don't think he's ever felt as good as he feels right now. And talk about Gunrunner. 
How about the immortal Galileo, his 99th group grade one winner, Bolshoi Ballet? That's pretty amazing. I don't know, Randy. She's uh, might taken over your role uh, here. I know. I know. I'm going to have to dig a little deeper in my rabbit hole next week. This All will right. be a two hour podcast next week. <laughs> All, right. All right. So the big racing coming up this weekend at Del Mar, the Pacific Classic uh, at Saratoga, the Jockey Club Gold Cup. Jockey Club Gold Cup, uh, Rattle and Roll and Proxy will probably be the two favorites. Another one of these uh, historic New York races that there's just too many on the calendar. Horses don't run enough. Where is White Aberio in this race? He'd be three to five for a stinking million dollars and they don't want to have anything <laughs> to do with it. I don't get it. But, you know, it is what it is. Pacific Classic is interesting for a couple things because uh, the favorites uh, look like they'll be three-year-olds in Go Rocket Ride and Arabian Night. See how they stack up against the older horses. And let's not forget the Kentucky Downs meet starts this week. These numbers are staggering. They have 11 stakes races worth $1 million or more on Saturday. Gunrunner Stakes, Randy, worth $1 million. The Music City Stakes worth $1 million. And the Mint Million Stakes worth $2 million. As a horse player, there's nothing I quite look forward to more than playing Kentucky Downs. Just uh, great racing there, big fields, and uh, you know, really wide open betting affairs. But that's the story of this weekend. What's yeah. on your uh, agenda this weekend, Randy? Speaking of Ron Winchell, owner of Kentucky Downs. Yeah. Yeah. Please fix your TV coverage, by the way. You've got all the money in the world. Fix the TV <laughs> coverage of Kentucky Downs, where you can actually see the races kind of up close and they'll right. switch 14 times. Uh, but what I'm most interested in in the Pacific Classic is this. Bob Baffert has defunded, who's now going to try to bounce back from a disappointing performance. He had to be considered one of the top horses for the Breeders' Cup Classic because he's based in California, and the Breeders' Cup will be run at Santa Anita this year, where he has excelled, but then last time... He lays an egg. One of the reasons I thought he laid an egg in his last race is that he wasn't quite really from the start, but he wasn't as into the race early as I think he likes to be. He is a front running type of horse. And Baffert is also running Arabian Night. And what we saw from Arabian Night in the Haskell, if you recall, is that he didn't take very kindly to being raided back off the pace for the first time. He didn't relax very well at all. He got a little bullheaded, so you would have to think that the strategy would be to go with Arabian Night, but where does that leave defund it? Sitting right behind him? Possibly. It's going to be an interesting tactical thing, and I'm going to be curious, Zoe, if defunded can bounce back to his earlier form. I don't think he's going to beat Go Rocket Ride. Um, Mandela is another trainer who's very good at keeping horses good when they're good, and I think he's finally got his number. He ran an amazing race in the Haskell and he completely put to bed Arabian night. Now Arabian night's not going to be back there eating any kickback, which is fine. He's going to go. That is for sure. And we'll, we'll see how they play out. Looks like there'll be 11 in there. Maybe all of those won't go, but go rocket ride. I think it's going to get the perfect trip under hall of fame of Mike Smith, who seemingly come to life down there. looks like Skinner will likely go in there. And then, you know, the old regulars, Tripoli stiletto boy, still plugging yeah. along getting a check. He's probably hit the board. He always does. Um, it'll be a good race. It'll be a good betting race. That is one thing I'll be looking forward to in the Pacific Classic. And some sad news that just broke this week. Jonathan Shepard passed away on Sunday at age 82. And, uh, you know, he had a, a career in thoroughbred racing, unlike anything we've seen from anybody else, where he won, was a prolific winner, both over jumps and on the flat. 3,426 career wins inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1990. And if you ever think, he, oh, he's just a jump trainer, he had two flat horses win Eclipse Awards forever together, an informed decision. Some people might forget he was also the trainer of a pretty good sire. You might remember a horse by the name of Stormcat, trained by Jonathan Shepard. Uh, a wonderful gentleman and uh, had a great career and uh, very sad to see him pass away this week. Yeah. I, I, you know, I didn't deal with him as an owner, obviously, uh, like George Strawbridge or others, but through the media, print and then TV media, I had the, uh, the pleasure of, uh, of making his acquaintance and dealing with him quite a number of times. And one of my all time favorites, such a nice man, such a gentleman and obviously uh, an incredibly talented horseman. If we could have bottled that old Etonian accent 
I mean, he sounded like a commercial from the 1940s. You know, when the <laughs> silent movies were done and they started finally talking, that is almost like they plucked Jonathan Shepard out of those movies and brought him to us. I first met him back in 2008. He came to Santa Anita with Forever Together for the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf, and I went by the barn, and I see this old boy sitting on a bucket outside the barn, a turned-up bucket, and he's got odd socks on. He's got a piece of baler twine around his waist holding up his pants, and then he's braiding another three baler twine to make a lead rope. And I'm like, is this Jonathan Shepard? And we sat down, and we probably chatted for an hour about everything. Just the classiest, nicest, true horseman, best guys in the game that you could ever come across. And he was a genius. The things he did at the farm with his flat horses that he did with his jump horses. I went to his house here in Saratoga about five years ago and did a, a sit down interview with him for XBTV. And just walking around his house and seeing the pictures of Stormcat and him and his family and the jumping and the history. I just feel fortunate to have, you know, been able to meet him. He was a true gentleman of the game, one that we won't see again, unfortunately. We really won't. Speaking of Saratoga, he also had that remarkable run. He won at least one race at every Saratoga meet consecutively for 47 years. Wow. Um, 47 straight years won a race at Saratoga. So Jonathan Shepard passes this week at age 82, and he will be missed. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by XBTV. This week's work of the week was the exciting TDN rising star Ways and Means. Now, she won her debut. She was no secret. She won by 12 plus lengths earlier in the Saratoga meet. The Claravetch homebred, homebred, Chad Brown saying, we can just breed our own now. She's by practical joke, worked four, four furlongs. In 49 and 4, under Peter, her regular exercise rider, he absolutely loves her, over the Oklahoma training track on a very busy morning for trainer Chad Brown in preparation for the September 3rd Spinaway Stakes on closing weekend at Saratoga. She will be a force to be reckoned with. We'll be right back after this message from XBTV. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. And the TD and Riders Room also brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie. And look at last week as an example. West Point had a big weekend. First of all, the Charlestown Oaks won by Vava, trained by Cherie DeVoe. That was the horse's first graded win. That was a grade three stakes for Vava. Then on Sunday, a back-to-back -back two-year-old double at Ellis Park. First depiction on the turf and then the process in his debut on the dirt. So you had Vava, depiction, and the process all acquired at the Keeneland September Yearling Sale and all picked out by West Point's bloodstock agent, David Ingordo of, among many others, of Flightline fame. Well, that's a wrap on this week's show. Uh, hopefully next week we will have more good things to talk about. Let's all keep our fingers crossed for that. Uh, I want to thank Randy Moss and Zoe Cabin, my cohorts here on the show, our Green Group Guest of the Week, Mark Cassie, our co-producers, Katie Petruniak and Anthony LaRocca, our editors, Alita LaRocca and Nathan Wilkinson. We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. TDN Writers Room Podcast.